Hello, everybody. Yes, I'm Simon. I'm part of the MST Cohort 2, uh, and I'm also the CEO of the King's Arms Project, which is a homeless and refugee charity based in Bedford, which is about an hour that way. Uh, and uh, yes, and we work kind of in Bedford mostly and a little bit across the east of England. So my research focuses on, on homelessness specifically in, in Bedford. But uh, really, to kind of tell you a bit more about my motivation for this uh, study, I want to tell you about a, a guy called Stuart. Now, Stuart was a, um, a resident of a hostel when I was a support worker about 10 years ago. And uh, he was, I was his key worker. Stuart was a long-term rough sleeper, and this was a high-support hostel. He'd been homeless, rough sleeping for about 15 years before he moved in with us. And uh, he'd been in you know, incredible kind of isolation on the streets, moved into our quite busy hostel, uh, but did really well. Started to get to grips with some of the things that made him homeless, or, or he picked up on the way. So some addiction issues, he got to grips with those. And he was really chatty around the hostel. A lovely guy to kind of be around would be seen in the communal areas usually, um, would be kind of sat around talking to residents or staff. And after 18 months, we managed to move him into his own flat. And I remember the day helping him up in the elevator, celebrating him as he moved into his flat. And he was a great success story. Except six months after that, we heard that Stuart had died. And we heard that he died on his own in his flat on the 16th floor in a sparsely, uh, sparsely furnished apartment. And, and so it seems to me, I believe absolutely, that homelessness can be solved, that we can solve it. But it became clear at that point that homelessness can't be solved by housing alone. And so for, for Stuart and, uh, and for others like him, I wanted to find out what it's really like to be homeless, what really the solutions can be, and what kind of impact we are having as, as service providers and how we can really improve the offer and, and make, uh, make it uh, see more success once people move on. And so, uh, the research methods I employed for my, for my, for my study were, were this. So I had observations, interviews, field diaries. Uh, there were 10 people involved and... Um, and, and I, I interviewed those people over 30 times, essentially. Uh, here I am. There I am. Hooray. Uh, so essentially, I followed, I followed these people around for a period of time. We'd sit wherever we could find, wherever they were comfortable. Sometimes it was in questionable cafes. Other times it was on park benches. And we'd just talk and learn more, each, more about each other. Uh, and I'd, I'd get them to tell, tell, their, tell me their story. Um, and uh, once I coded the, coded the kind of data that I found out, I found that you could think about the homeless journey in three uh, sort of temporal phases. First, you had the pre-encounter phase, and that's the time when some, between when someone first finds themselves homeless and before they have any engagement with an intervention. Next, there's the encounter, in, intervention encounter stage, where they're involved in the intervention, so that time spent engaging with the interventions. And then last, there's this post post-intervention, after the intervention, uh, where the time they spent after the intervention makes sense. Uh, and here, we have a fancy pants diagram, uh, which kind of explains that, kind of the three phases, shows the, the three phases moving from left to right uh, and, and, and adds some words to it. It also shows the rising number of homelessness, homeless in grey and the uh, rising number of rough sleepers, uh, sorry, rising number of homeless in orange, rising number of rough sleeper in, in grey. Uh, but I just want to really focus on these, on these three phases. Uh, so in this, in this first phase, people are, are newly homeless to the streets. Um, they're completely isolated, and they're entirely reliant on information from other homeless people to know where to go and what to do. They're completely cut off from mainstream society. Uh, and one participant told me that he would... He, when he was rough sleeping, he would wake up every morning and there'd be a cup of coffee and some sandwiches by his head that someone had left him as he passed, which he said was just great. It was lovely. But every morning when he ate it, he was tinged with sadness because he just wished that person had stayed around for a little bit so he could talk to someone and just feel normal for a while. And so they're completely isolated and completely dependent on other homeless people who are the other only people that seem to talk to them and tell them where to go. And, and because of this, they're kind of susceptible to rumours that kind of kick up about what it's like to engage with certain interventions. And so uh, one, one participant told me that he would never go to the night shelter because people get stabbed there all the time. They're always getting stabbed if you're at the night shelter. 
Well, I know that in its 30-year history, no one's ever been stabbed at the night shelter. But he decided that he wouldn't engage with the service because that's what he'd heard someone had told him. Also in this first stage, right in the pre-intervention stage, uh, there, there's something that I called sense blocking, which is uh, kind of an active attempt to dampen the extreme emotion of being on the streets. Uh, and that's often done through drugs or through alcohol. And drugs uh, are readily available. I remember one, one particularly sobering moment where an outreach worker, uh, sorry, a, a participant was sort of looked at me and said, you think you've got the best outreach workers in the world? And, you know, they are quite good, but it took them three weeks to find me in my tent. And within 24 hours, a drug dealer had found me. And it wasn't mean, it wasn't nasty, but they offered, offered me my first hit free. They were essentially offering me a service to help me get through, to dampen the emotion of the situation that I found myself in. So that's the first stage, pre-encounter. And then you move into this middle phase, which is the encounter phase. And in contrast to the isolation of being on the streets, uh, this is often very busy, full of people, very relational. And when I ask people about how they found certain interventions, they'd often, tell, they'd often judge the quality of it by the relationships that they made at the intervention. They'd say things like, it feels like family, about a night shelter. Or they'd say, uh, when they asked, what, you know, why do they, they, they were explaining why they engaged on certain courses that were run for the homeless. And uh, this guy was telling me he signed up for every course he could possibly find. He didn't actually know what any of the courses were for. He just knew that when he stepped on the bus that picked him up for these courses, he knew he'd have someone to talk to, and he knew he'd have some friends. Um, and I was also surprised when one participant told me that he chose one night shelter over another uh, one night shelter was much better from my perspective. It had its, you had your own room. Uh, you could stay there during the day. Uh, it was a, you were kind of left to your own devices and, and to, had a bit more kind of independence. The other used to fall to a room, tight rules. You had to leave during the day. But he chose that second night shelter because he said there was always someone around. There was a safety blanket, someone to talk to. And in this kind of uh, relation, more relational phase, busy phase, the kind of extremeness of the streets uh, starts to dampen down and the sense blocking starts to stop and people start to try and make sense of what's happened to them and to think about life beyond homelessness. And then we come to this last one. And this one, uh, the last phase, the post-encounter phase. And, uh, and this is, we've, I found that people that were successful in moving out of homelessness were those that were able to build relationships and build community with people outside of the homeless community. And those that weren't able to do that generally weren't successful and seemed to circle, circle back around. And uh, those that were able to build relationships outside of homelessness usually did it through employment or through, or through religion. Um, uh, and the other kind of overriding thing in both whether you moved on positively neg or negatively in that after intervention phase was the sense of obligation that they all felt to those that were new to the streets. They really felt it was important to look out for those that were new to the streets, make sure they knew where they were going. And uh, as, I, as I sat in, sat in a, another cafe, <laughs> I drank a lot of tea. Uh, as, I sat, as I sat in another cafe, this, this participant pointed at his boots and he said, uh, when I was rough sleeping, I'd walk for miles in these boots. And I didn't, know, I didn't know where I was going. I just kept walking and walking because I didn't know where to go and I didn't want to stop. Now I put the same boots on every morning to walk to my job. And I wear the same boots. Uh, and it reminds me, sorry, when I look at my boots, it reminds me that I need to go back to the streets and I need to make sure that no one's in the same position I was. So he goes back three or four times a week, even though he's in, in kind of independent living, he's, he's got a job, he goes back three or four times a week walking the streets at night to try and find anyone that looks new to the streets, making sure that they know where to go. So there's a real sense of, of obligation in that, in that post-encounter post phase. And so really then to kind of reiterate my key findings from the study, were the information flow is really interesting. Uh, and information is entirely lacking for those new to the streets and is entirely controlled by those that uh, have, have more experience of homelessness. And that can almost form like a hierarchy uh, of, of what of what's people believe. The next is that sense blocking happens when, when kind of emotion is too extreme that people can't process what's happened to them. And those new to the streets uh, are, are thinking about survival and, and not about a long-term plan. So they go into the sense blocking mode and that's often done through drugs or alcohol, which are, are readily available. 
And then lastly, relationships and community is key in, in solving homelessness. Those that are able to get out of homelessness are the ones that are able to build relationships with people outside of homelessness, and those that aren't, don't. And so I think that has uh, big implications for both policy and practice. There's a lot of talk about uh, individualization, housing first, uh, a person-centered. It's all about individual, which I think is absolutely right and good, but we mustn't forget about this community piece. How do we help people find belonging and a place to be inside wider community? And, and I also think that some of these findings will be applicable uh, to other poor groups, or I'd be interested to find out if they are applicable to other poor groups of this relationship piece, if they're able to build relationships outside of the situation they're in, that that is an important part of them getting out of the poverty they find themselves in. So I think that homelessness can end still, and I still think we can do it, but it's about more than housing, and so we need to work all of that in. Great, the end. You.